All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everybody and welcome to the A to J Author Online Intake Series. This is Dina Nicotaitis with the Center for Access to Justice and Technology at Chicago Kent College of Law. Before we get started today, I want to let you know that you are all on mute. Um, you can raise your hand and we'll unmute you if you have a question or you can put a question in the question box and we'll try to check those as we go. If you are listening through your computer speakers and you don't have a microphone, you're also welcome to put any questions or comments that you have in that questions box. If you have dialed in today, we need you to enter your audio pen for us to be able to hear you when you want to speak to us. Um, and if you're having any issues with audio, a lot of times hanging up and dialing back in magically resolves those go-to meeting issues. One last uh, mention here is that we are recording this session um, and we will post this on the adjauthor.org website. So if you are uncomfortable with this, now would be a great time for you to exit the GoToMeeting. Um, but other than that, then we're going to go ahead and get started. So today's session, this is the online intake series, part five, up and running. So these are kind of questions that I was thinking that your programs might have about where does the information go once you start getting these applications and what happens next and just all kinds of staffing and program issues that come up around this time. We do have with us today guest speakers from Legal Services Corporation, Cheryl Nolan and David Bonebreak, and they will be speaking later, as you can see on the agenda, about LSC activities around the online intake area and be taking questions that you might have from them. Um, so today I'm going to just briefly go through a little bit of online intake author review, what we've gone through the first five, five parts so far, and then talk about today's topic, up and running, what happens now, um, and then we'll have LSC speak and then we'll just review a little bit of additional resources at the end. So the online intake process, this is just a review of what you guys have already seen. The online intake process typically starts with an A to J interview that is posted online and users have access to this interview, they submit their data, their interview answers are stored in an answer file that goes through what we talked about last um, session, the XSL transform. This is a little bit of code that takes the answers from the A to J format and transforms it into the format that a case management system, your case management system, can read. So then you have the transformed answer files. And then the transformed answer files are able to be imported into your case management system. And this is kind of the area that we'll be speaking about today. What happens once those um, intake applications start coming in? What happens to the data? What kind of review process you'll go through, etc. So we've also talked about over the past four series uh, sessions, uh, different, the project management sort of aspects of online intake development for a project in your program. So we've already gone through the planning and preparation page and phases and talked about stakeholder meetings and identifying roles and getting um, borrowing an intake script and how to go through A to J author and update someone else's script and testing and then last session was all of the more technical transforms and hosting the interview and this session is more about the implementation stage. So your staff training and what you're going to do and how this is going to actually look once it's up and running. So what happens next? Some, program, some questions that your program might have will be who's going to process these applications. Um, obviously, budgets are tight for everyone in legal aid, and we know that most people can't hire more staff, so what's going to happen once these applications start coming in? This could be a huge concern for your program. What happens once the application is received with the information? Where does that go? How is it handled? And then you've created this interview. How much in uptake or upkeep is there going to be for your program? So looking at the first question, who is going to process this online applications? Does your program need to consider hiring new staff? And what's great is with online intake is that programs that have already been doing this for the past year or more than a year have reported to us that they have not needed to hire any new staff. That really what happens, the number of applications coming in is the same, they just come in via a different avenue. So instead of having more phone calls, you have online intake applications and a little bit less um, coming in through your phone line or walk-ins. Um, what's also great with the online application is that we've had some programs report that their staff has felt that it takes them less time per applicant when the application comes in online. So they already have all of the information. The information is typically 
correctly stated, the names are you know spelled correctly and things like that. So when an intake worker then follows up with the applicant that applied online, it takes less time for them to go through and verify information and actually get right to the issue um, that needs to be addressed. So some ideas for your staffing that I just threw out there were, you know, how are you going to handle this? Which staff members are going to be in charge? And you could rotate a staff member, your staff members, your intake, um, you know, who's going to be in charge of online applications by maybe the day or the week, depending on how many um, applications that you might start to see come in. Um, or, you know, maybe you have a lot of applications and it's enough to have one full-time intake person taken off of your walk-in and phone line and dedicate them to online intake. Um, so just some different ideas and every program just needs to kind of work through these things and talk about them. So these are just um, ideas that I want to bring up so that you guys know to think ahead about these issues. And then also with your staffing, is there going to be any special training? And really, your intake process should stay the same. So your qualifications should stay the same, how you run your conflicts checking will be the same. So the only special training that you need is where the online intake process differs from the regular intake process. Um, and really those areas are just going to be the technology areas. So where are those applications coming in? Is there a mystery box someplace that needs to be checked? Um, and then what happens, you know, at what point do conflicts check and then what's the procedure for following up. So that part would be a little bit different, but really I would think the majority of how you're doing intake stays the same, so there's not that much additional training that's going to need to happen once you get your online intake application up and running. So now that you have your staff figured out and everyone's trained and they know these applications are gonna start to come in, what do you do when the information does start to come in? So where does that application information go? And again, these are all things that your programs individually need to talk through. Um, so some options, as we showed in the diagram, you know, when the information comes in, if you create that transform, you can have that information go directly into your case management system. So that's an option. Um, some programs have created a separate holding area, a little separate table within their case management system to identify that these are the um, applications that have come in and you know haven't been reviewed yet. So that's their holding area for their intake staff person to go through and follow up with those intake applications. You could also create a separate database if you wanted to, if you had some reasons that you didn't want to import directly into your case management system that has all of your current client files, you could create a separate database. And I also want to mention, and I think we've mentioned before, that you don't have to connect to a case management system. If for some reason your program is hesitant to do so, um, or maybe you don't have the funding to put through the technology to create the transform and go through that process, you can still do online intake. You can still have the great A to G author interface, but really it would just be another document assembly project. And so at the end of the intake interview, the user would actually complete the document and they could then print and mail it in or come in with their application already completed or you could set up a system for them to email and attach that email application um, and then your intake process would be exactly the same as it is. It would just be that the inter or the applicant actually was the one to fill out the information which again would reduce a lot of the just documentation errors and misspellings and things like that. Um, that kind of process would just require a hot docs template to go along with the A to J author template to create that document. So you don't always have to go straight into your case management system. I do tend to talk about that a lot because it is a very efficient way to handle it. Um, and if your program is you know, interested in that, then sometimes it's nice to just go ahead and go straight through and go into your case management system. Um, so lots of options there. Again, just ideas for your program to kind of discuss at what level they're comfortable with doing their online intake. And then what about conflicts checking? So when you typically do intake, you probably don't go ahead and collect every bit of information from the person and then run a conflicts check. You probably check a conflicts um, part of the way through after you get necessary information and then you find out if it's possible for them to be a client. With online intake, you're likely gathering more information than you would um, prior to doing your conflicts check. 
So one idea is if you have any concerns about that is having additional information is that your case management system or the separate database or, or wherever you're holding that information, um, you could create a system that would hide any information that's not needed to do a conflicts check and then your, app, your intake worker would run the conflicts check if it's okay to um, have that person as a client then the information would then be shown and it can be assigned out to an attorney and the whole process then is the same. Um, but that's just another idea. So if you have these concerns that come up about how much information you're collecting, you don't have to do it in two parts. You can go ahead and collect all of the information, put in any language that your, com your program would feel comfortable with explaining in the interview to the client. You know, you're going to give them lots of warnings that this does not you know, automatically create an attorney-client relationship and things like that. And you can also give them the comfort that, you know, your information will not be shared unless we can accept you with a client and things like that. Um, so just a couple more things for your programs to consider. So also, now that you have this information coming in, you're going to have different kinds um, of applicants, different levels of applicants, just like you do when they call on the phone. But what happens? You have all this information come in. Do all of the applicants get a call back, a letter, email, some kind of follow-up? Um, and it is definitely a choice that your program needs to make. Uh, what level you can, um, what level of contact your program feels comfortable um, with for each type of applicant. So you can see in this gray area here that these are just some ideas. So you might set up a system of who we're going to call back, who gets letters, or who gets no responses if your program's okay with that. And then a no response, um, in my mind, the way I think of that is that you've actually created filters within the A to J guided interview. So the interview itself is actually filtering out people maybe that have um, uh, too high of income, or maybe their problem type isn't something that your program handles, and so you've redirected them and given them the correct um, legal aid organization or place where they can receive help. So to me, that would be when I talk about no response. So really what's happening is that your program doesn't even know those applications happened because they were filtered out and they never actually got to submit the application. They were filtered out before the end of that process. Um, if you're not comfortable having your A to J interview filter anyone out, you know, maybe your program wants to double check the finances or make sure that the applicant understood what the problem type really was, you could also flag these applications. So flag it that, you know, there might be qualification issues due to finance or problem code. Um, and then your intake worker can immediately get to that point with this applicant, whether they follow up in an email or a call, they can just immediately address that issue um, and take less time than collecting all the information from the beginning. But that's an area that, again, your programs each have to determine what they're comfortable with. Um, but that no response kind of area, if your program is comfortable with that, then it does help kind of narrow down the applicant pool that your intake workers have to um, interact with. And, actually they get a more concentrated pool of people that they can help. Um, so letters or emails, I'm not sure whose programs or how you contact people. If once their application gets through, maybe you've run a conflicts check and find out that now you can't accept them as a client. What kind of follow-up if you, you know, if your program wants a letter or an email or if they want to call back no matter what. Again, all things that you have to um, discuss and determine what your program would like. Um, what's nice with a letter or an email, if your program is comfortable with that, is that I know some case management systems can automatically generate a letter that can be um, sent out to the applicant, so it kind of automates that process and makes it a little faster. So also, what happens once you've received an application and you have all of this data, yet for whatever reason you had to reject the applicant? Um, this is completely up to your program again, but there's all kinds of options. You could just immediately purge that data. So basically that application never happened. You have nothing on record of that applicant. Um, you could possibly keep enough info or information for um, reporting purposes. So maybe you have grant funding or something like that that wants to know demographic information um, about your applicants or geographical information. So you could always 
have a filter in your case management system that really would be similar to that conflicts check filter where you're only seeing the only the information that you would need. You could actually purge, um, you know, names if you really only wanted to know, you know, maybe geographic information or demographic information. Um, or you could keep this information in a separate database, or you could possibly keep it for a set period of time and then purge it. So there's all kinds of options, but these are things that your program needs to be thinking of because once these applications start coming in, you want to have your system up and ready and set to go with what kind of processes. Everything can be adjusted as well. So you might start off one way with keeping the data and then saying, okay, we've got way too much data, let's pare it down um, and adjust as you go. But it's just a good idea to have kind of your action plan up and running before your <laughs> intake um, applications get up and running. So how much upkeep is there? Um, how often are you going to need to address this on like online intake interview? You know, maybe you have spent an entire year from the beginning meetings through the testing phases and you're up and running and how, mon how much more time is this going to take? Is it going to be a burden? Um, and I don't think it's a burden at all. I think that, you know, the online intake interview does need to be addressed periodically, but really I would say at least as often as your client qualifications change. If you have a change in income level, or maybe you start to take on different problem areas that you didn't before, or maybe you restrict your problem areas and you're narrowing your field, um, when those things change, that changes for all of your intakes. So those are the areas and the times when you're going to need to address your online intake interview. I also think that in the beginning, you might want to pay a little more attention to your online intake interview, or if you hear things from um, applicants, or if there's any kind of reports from them, that maybe they didn't really understand something in the interview. You know, a lot of times we we know exactly what we want to say when we're creating these interviews and it makes sense to us and even when you have your other staff members tested it makes sense to them because they're all extremely familiar but until you have your actual applicants that really don't understand this process um, in the legal process that they're going to be facing once they go through it you might not realize some things that could either be cleared up or explained a little bit better also applicants will find bugs that no matter how much testing you do you're not going to find them but someone else will so in that beginning phase you know maybe within <clears throat> the first couple of months you might want to have a little more flexibility in being able to have someone update that interview but I really think that after that, it's going to be very easy and kind of self-sustaining and would just change as your, as your intake qualifications change. Um, and one tip that I do have is that when you're creating the interview, be flexible in the actual programming in A to J author. So for example, if you have something that requires the applicant to give you a date, don't limit that date to 2011 because we're about to go into 2012 and then you're going to have to go back in and every place there's a date that was limited, you know, on, by 2011, you're going to have to change. So A to J author allows the flexibility of you um, for using that's actually a feature in A to J out there, you can just use the word today in a date field. And that will actually limit every date field as high as they can go with today's date. Um, so that's a handy thing and that's something that makes it so that you don't have to go back in the future and say, okay, how many you know, places did we have dates and you know, we limited it to this date, so now we have to change all the years because it's a new year. Um, so just kind of think about flexibility when you're building that interview for to actually save yourself from having to go through in the future and constantly update those areas. Um, another great thing to think about and to have a process for is bug or error reporting. So you need to have a way that applicants can contact you if the online intake application isn't working or maybe they've gotten stuck someplace on the application. Um, maybe they just have questions about it. Um, so there should be kind of whatever process that you want. Maybe you wanted to limit it just to bug reporting. Um, you know, that's a pr program decision that you're going to have to make. But there should be some way for applicants to reach out to you to let you know that they've found an error or that they have um, not been able to, for some reason, progress through the interview. And then for your program, you should probably think about who is responsible for those error reports. Maybe they're coming in through an email address that you've listed on your website. 
you know, where you've linked to your, your online intake interview. And so maybe there needs to be someone who those emails are directed to or someone responsible for checking that particular email. Um, maybe, again, that could be rotates by your staff members if you're rotating. Um, and then you should also have someone on your staff, even if you've contracted out the development of your intake interview, you probably want to have someone on your staff that's a little bit familiar with the back end of your interview, enough to be able to go in and change maybe, you know, a description of something if language isn't, ends up not being clear enough or something like that. Um, so just a few more things and processes that you should probably have in place before you get online intake up and running. Um, hopefully these will be things that you can think about and save yourself time in the future um, from having to go back and make too many changes to your process. But what is nice about online intake and A to J author is that it's extremely flexible. So any changes that do need to be made can be made easily. Um, so as your qualifications change and things like that, it's not that difficult to go in and just change some numbers. Um, so that is kind of my run through for what happens um, once you're up and running. So I would like to pause now and see, I'm going to go back here, just, oh, there's our agenda, yep. Um, and so we'll have LSC speak next about kind of what they've been doing around online intake and if they have any future activities planned. Um, but I'd like to stop and see if there's any questions. Also, if we have people who have online intake programs up and running and if you have any advice in this area of, okay, you know, you're, you're just getting started. Um, any advice for anyone out there who hasn't done this part yet, we'd be very happy to hear from you as well. So you can put questions in the question box or you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Okay, so I'm not hearing from anyone, and we'll go ahead and take questions as we go along. Um, so if you have something that I spoke about and then you think about it later, you're welcome to ask us at the end. But right now I would like to pass over um, controls to Cheryl Nolan and David Bonebrake so they can speak to you about LSC activities in the area of online intake. So Cheryl, would you like me to make you presenter? Um, well, actually, I think David, I was going to give David the control Controls. panel. Over the okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let me pass that Thank over you, to David. you. You're welcome. So, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dina. Um, there were several pieces to what you were speaking about um, just now that touch on specific areas that we've been considering at LSC, so it's a perfect transition for us. Um, one of the biggest areas that LSC has been involved with in online intake, I guess over the last year and a half, I hesitate to say two years, has been focusing on a program letter that we are very near to releasing um, for public comment. Um, we've, we mentioned and presented on the pro program letter at last year's TIG conference and um, provided some initial guidance to the field on that. And then came back to our home base and um, through the intake focus group, which is an internal committee that I chair. Um, and as an aside, the, the committee is comprised of members of both management and staff from both the Office of Program Performance, the Office of Compliance and Enforcement, and David Bonebrake um, representing the TIG side of things. Um, we have a good cross-section of related and relevant staff on that, that committee, that working group. Um, at any rate, we came back from the conference, back to home base, started working more focused in a more focused way on that program letter and it's brought us to now. So um, I can't unfortunately show you the program letter yet. At this point it's um, under final review, but what I did want to announce today is that it's, it's very close to being published in the Federal Register and put out for public comment and we're anticipating a 30-day comment period and would be very interested in any comment from the field. So. The main point I want to get across today is that it's very close to being published. I don't, I can't say the exact date. Um, we were hopeful it would have been published by this webinar, um, but I think due to the holidays, it's just it's been a little a little um, difficult to get that done. But it should be any day now published. And essentially, what the online intake program letter will do is reestablish the, the feedback and guidelines that we've been providing to the field over the last year and a half, but in a better and more refined, more comprehensive way. 
Um, earlier drafts of that program letter uh, were reviewed by Jim Sandman when he came on board. And I think, I think the field would be, I think, um, assured to know that he saw things, a different set of eyes. He saw things that we weren't seeing. Um, and one of the most important things was that you know, he didn't want LSC to be expecting or requiring more of the field in terms of online intake than we were already requiring in other forms of eligibility screening. And that led to um, a series of very, um, very focused um, conversations and work at the intake focus group, fine-tuning just what that is and how, what does that look like. So I'm pleased to say that I feel pretty confident that what we put together now and, and is under final review um, has achieved that. The, you know, the bottom line in layman's terms is that we're not changing the world of eligibility screening with this program letter. What we are doing is kind of saying the same expectations apply, and here are the possibilities that programs can use. Um, but I don't think the programs are going to see anything in the program letter that's going to change what you're already doing. So that's kind of a general description. Um, David and I. To the extent that we can, we'll be happy to answer some questions for you about the program letter today. Um, we'll be limited, though, in that, one, we're not Office of Compliance and Enforcement staff, so we can't answer questions about eligibility. Um, and we can't, like I said, I can't unfortunately show the program letter to you because it's not yet published. Um, but we did want to offer the opportunity to talk with um, folks about it if there were specific questions. So that is the most, um, I think, the most exciting activity going on right now at the corporation. Um, the other thing is just, you know, moving forward, you know, LSC is very interested and exciting, excited and supportive of what's happening with online intake. And we recognize that it's a major trend, if not, you know, the wave of the future for intake. And so we are trying to stay as best as we can on top of what's happening with the programs, what are the best practices. And to the extent it comes up, we actively share it with other programs as well that are interested. So, um, so that's, I guess, the other thing I can say about future activities. We continue to look for relevant topics um, to present at conferences. We continue to look for best practices to feature on our Legal Resource Initiative website um, and, and other related you know, interactions with programs. So I guess at this point it might be good to open it up to questions unless, David, is there something that I forgot to cover that you should add in? Well, I, I could talk a little bit about uh, specifically what TIG has been doing around online intake because there's, uh, in addition to participating in the intake focus group, and actually share a lot, of, uh, Glenn Rod and Andi are, are uh, part oh, of that group. Yeah. How could <laughs> so, I forget? I'm so sorry. My apologies uh, to oh, no, no, but we're well, we're well represented uh, on, on that group. Uh, but but just to talk about some just kind of general activities that TIG has done, uh, the last funding cycle we actually funded more online intake projects than we have uh, maybe in all uh, previous funding cycles combined. Uh, it was a, a big year for online intake, uh, and we had we had several projects uh, that came in under the replication category. Generally, the projects ranged uh, in, in funding from about thirty-five to fifty thousand uh, dollars for for the grant award. And kind of recognizing that we had a lot of projects coming in, uh, we have tried to streamline some of the administrative work uh, that needs to be done to manage these TIGs effectively, uh, specifically. I've worked with Bristow Harden to create uh, some templates for the evaluation plan that you have to do for, for all TIGs. So if you have an online intake uh, TIG next year, um, you're going to be able to use this template to hopefully very quickly put together your evaluation plan. And you may have to refine it somewhat and, and add a new objective depending on what your project's focusing on. But uh, you know, we tried to do a lot of the legwork to make that easier for, uh, for everyone. I also wanted to mention, too, that um, there is a, a 2012 TIG funding cycle that we will announce early next year, and that uh, programs are welcome to submit uh, online intake applications under the replication category, uh, so that uh, you'll have more information about that at, at the beginning of the year. Uh, but you know, I imagine we'll, we'll probably see more online intake applications uh, uh, going forward. 
Uh, finally, at the TIG conference, we're going to have several online intake focus sessions. Uh, Richard Zorza is going to lead a couple sessions that I think focus more on, on triaging and kind of continuum of service uh, type of issues, but are also going to involve online intake. Uh, Cheryl's going to be there leading a more informal session on online intake. Um, there's also going to be opportunities to uh, network uh, in affinity group type uh, sessions. Uh, for, for, with folks that are also also doing uh, online intake projects. And I guess, Dean, I should mention, too, that uh, there's going to be a A to J, next generation A to J author session uh, that I imagine we'll, we'll kind of talk a little bit about online intake, but probably more about kind of A to J author uh, generally. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and, you know, and I think on the uh, the program letter, uh, we we do kind of really, as Cheryl said, kind of recognize that the prog that programs are really moving forward with online intake, and we need to get uh, you know something out there. And uh, you know, I, I think folks will find that it's a, it's a really thoughtful letter, and I think you'll you'll appreciate the, the guidance that's there, um, and that will go out through the the usual uh, kind of means that the program letter goes out, but I'll make sure, because I know a lot of folks may not monitor that and may be more on the LS tech list uh, uh, with this audience, so I'll make sure that, you know, that that, that notice is also available uh, through the LS tech list and you uh, are, are apprised of it through, through that way as well. Yeah, and I, I wanted to add, too, to what David was saying about the program letter. You know, I think one other component of the program letter that I am able to share is that there's a piece near the end, kind of a conclusory paragraph that kind of describes that LSC recognized that the technology is always evolving and um, also recognizes the value of the TIG, the TIG program and opens up the possibility that through changes in technology, things may change in the future and that LSC would want to be informed of those changes and that if some of the changes came across that that would enable you know, different sets of, of screening um, practices and policies that LSC would be open to changing the program letter. So you know, it's, it's kind of more like a, a program letter for the now, um, but that the possibility of future changes and advancements in technology are within the purview and consideration of the corporation. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So do we have any, is there, are there any questions regarding any of this or any comments from folks? I think we have a quiet group today. I know. <laughs> I think they want us to go Maybe. back and finish up the program letter. <laughs> program letter, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I certainly, you know, for for after the, if, if somebody has a question after the webinar, please feel free to contact either one of us. It's, um, again, we're very interested in what the field has to say. I would hope that folks, when it is published, would really um, take the opportunity to review it closely. Please provide any and all feedback, input, and comment that you feel is necessary. We really, you know, do, do want to hear from the field about what it means to them and what their thoughts are. And in the end, we just want a really good program letter. Yeah, I'll just echo that. I mean, I think that the feedback from the field is something that is, uh, you know, really valued here, and uh, the committee is really interested in hearing kind of, you know, the, what people think of the things that we've been discussing uh, related to this letter for, for well, a while now. Uh, but, but, but that feedback is, is definitely very important to the process. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that happened, too, with the program letter is that earlier on we had talked with Jim about putting together an advisory committee to review the draft and provide feedback to us. And then later on in the process, we determined that it would be much more advisable to open it up to the field as a whole. And that's how we came across the public comment in the Federal Register process. So I'm, I'm pleased to see that it's going to a wider audience. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that, you know, with us sending it out through the different means, the listservs and, and email groups that we have, you know, that people will really take the time. And, and we were hopeful, you know, that perhaps we are hopeful that this public comment period will bracket the TIG conference. So um, if that does happen, which we believe we'll be able to pull off, um, we'll have the program letter with us at the conference, and we can use the conference as another avenue to talk about the actual specifics and the components of the program letter and get some more input. 
So that was another, I think, important piece for us is the timing of it and, you know, whether we could time it to coincide with the TIG conference. So well, I think other than those pieces, I can't think of anything else that we can add about the program letter or online intake at LSC. Well, I think um, it's been great to have you guys to kind of share with us and kind of set expectations for when people might be able to see that program letter. Um, and I do hope that a lot of you, I know a lot of people on this list will probably be at TIG, so hopefully we'll see you at the online intake session. Um, I will, I'll be, I'll try to make sure I'm at that one unless it overlaps with my A to J one. Um, so thank you very much, both David and Cheryl, for being here with us. And if you guys um, have any questions that you think of, I'm going to kind of wrap up and show you a few more things. But if anything comes to mind that you would still like to ask um, Cheryl and David before the end of the call, go ahead and raise your hand or put a question in the box. Um, so I'm actually just going to take back controls for a second. So while, um, <clears throat> or right after I had asked if there were any questions on my part, we had um, <clears throat> Maria from Colorado, who is actually working on an online intake project, has mentioned that one of the great things when she was talking about um, developing the online intake script was that to kind of gauge more of what the users might see for her interview or what questions they might have or what might be clearest to them um, was that she's actually had her online intake staff run through the interview. Um, they are the ones who deal with the applicants, so they um, better understand what language would be uh, clearest to the online intake applicant um, and what kind of issues or maybe how to state things or break things down. Um, so I thought that was great advice from her and it kind of went towards, you know, how much upkeep is there going to be, you know, if there are changes that you need to make in the beginning because your users aren't understanding maybe how you thought you were being clear about something, um, your intake staff is probably a great place to bounce those ideas off of and have them run through the interview um, for language and flow and kind of order of things and um, make sure that everything sounds great to them as well. So thank you, for um, Maria, for sharing that. If anyone else who's on the call has um, gone through online intake or has their project up and running and would like to share any else that they have advice for anyone, this is our last online intake training series for 2011. Um, this was part five of my five-part series. So um, please share with us now any advice that you have or if you have any questions about anything that we've covered for these past five calls. Um, I think we probably even have John Mayer on the call. So if you have a technical question from something that maybe he presented before, we have all kinds of resources to help answer. So please send us your questions. You can always follow up with me later as well. So we have additional resources. So maybe um, you just can't think of something right now or maybe you're looking for something that we've talked about in one of the previous trainings. We do record and post these trainings on ajauthor.org. Um, we have an online intake tools and trainings page. You can see sample interviews from other programs that have very generously shared their hard work so that you can hopefully start your program, um, your online intake interview and get going a little more quickly. There's also slides and recordings from the past training so you can go back and see anything that we've talked about. Um, I do have on here from additional resources, this was the original LSC intake policy compliance that they had, um, this was their presentation from TIG last year. Um, so I'm not sure that that is still hopefully this year at TIG, there'll be a whole new one, but this was their last presentation from last year if there was something that you were trying to remember um, that came out in 2011 at the TIG conference there. So there's always additional resources that you guys can look for. Also, going into 2012, um, there are more A to G author trainings. So first, I hope that you all will be at TIG and that you can come and listen to the online intake sessions and also the A to J um, kind of future of A to J session because we'd really like input. We hope that's going to be a very interactive session. Um, but right before the TIG conference in January, from Monday and Tuesday, and TIG starts on Wednesday, um, um, we are going to have an A2J author and hot docs live training. So Pro Bono Net hosts a two-day training. The training is free to you. You just need to pay for your accommodations and your travel, your meals, etc. But the two-day training um, for hot docs and A2J author, um, 
you can sign up for for free. So that is listed on the adjauthor.org website on the front page. If you haven't gotten to sign up for that yet, they do limit the number of spots. There is usually um, an uh, intro kind of level to both softwares and then also an advanced session. So please join us there. I'd like to see you all in person. And then going into 2012, um, I'm going to continue doing A to J Author new user trainings once a month. And then this past year we did advanced trainings in online intake series every other month. I'm still trying to see if there's enough interest to continue doing online intake. So if you have anything to say about that, I love feedback. So if you're still looking for more information about online intake, maybe you joined us part of the way through the series, um, let me know that you have interest. I'm probably going to be sending out a survey to all of our training attendees to kind of just judge how the year went for our trainings. Um, so again, we love the feedback so that we can provide you with what you need. Um, and so lastly, I have just a thank you for our go-to meeting services that uh, Kelly has been very generous in providing for the past, I think, half of a year. Um, so as always, we greatly appreciate them so that we can continue to provide you guys with these trainings. And then if you have any questions or feedback, I can always be reached. This is my email and my direct line here. Again, love the feedback on training sessions or a to author software itself. So let me check this question box one last time. Uh, Dina, I'd just like to add that if any programs have questions about uh, potential uh, projects or online intake applications, they're uh, welcome to talk to uh, any, anyone on the TIG staff about that. So uh, myself, uh, Glenn Rodden, or Jane Rubinera, uh, we'd be happy to uh, provide some feedback about any project ideas uh, that folks have. And we'll actually, the last day of the conference, uh, the, one of the final sessions, will be an opportunity uh, to kind of learn more about the 2012 cycle, but also ask questions and potentially brainstorm some projects and get feedback on those uh, from the three of us. Great. Great. So lots of potential activity happening at TIG, hopefully. Um, so I don't really see any more questions from you guys. So hopefully that means that we've done a good job of giving you all the information that your programs need. Um, we really appreciate you sticking out this five-part series with us. And like I said, let me know if there's things that we haven't covered or you'd like more information about uh, so we can get our training series set up for next year. Um, so thank you again to Cheryl and David from LSD for being with us today. And I hope you all enjoy your holidays and have a great new year. Thank you, Dina. Great. Thanks, Dina. Take care. Bye-bye.